This episode of Steve's Outdoor Adventures was brought to you by the Adventure Armory. Rifle, scope, and ammo packages for hunters. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures is sponsored by Ochicos.com. This week, Travis Price is continuing to travel to all of our camps and lodges across North America and learning the ins and outs of the operations, the hunting, and the animals. This experience will help him properly advise our clients about these hunts and make sure that they're properly booked and on the right hunt to fit their needs. This is Travis's first trip to Alaska and his very first experience in the Arctic. He will first fly up to Fairbanks, Alaska, where he will meet up with Steve's Outdoor Adventures client, Bruce Whitaker. From Fairbanks, they will next fly over the high mountains of the Brooks Range, beyond the area where a few years ago I hunted for caribou north of Anaktuvik Pass and go into the extreme northern community of Umiat. Oh, well, I don't know. It was foggy all the way and you couldn't see anything. And I was like, I sure hope he knows where he's going. All of a sudden he come down, there was an airstrip, bam. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was something. It was really something, something I've never experienced. Once we landed into the Arctic, I just couldn't believe my eyes and what I was experiencing. It's just totally new country for me and beautiful, um, beautiful river, tundra, just amazing country. This is where the adventure truly begins. Well beyond the reach of telecommunications and deep into the Arctic wilderness. From here, first Bruce, then Travis are flown in the smaller aircraft even further into the Arctic wilderness, where they will land at a remote tented camp. This will be home for the duration of their hunt. Once in camp, they met their guide, Ed, and after spending some time getting acquainted with him in the tent, they headed out and checked the zero on the rifle that they'll be hunting with this week. Travis has brought up his Bergara B14 Hunter rifle, chambered in 300 Winchester Magnum, and topped with the Burris Eliminator 3 laser scope. The rifle went through load development at Pendleton Ammunition and is shooting 175 grain Barnes LRX ammunition in a custom load. With everything done and ready for the next day, the hunters settle in and relax, absorbing the tranquility of the Arctic, unaware of the weather that is headed their way. So we woke up today to some not so ideal hunting conditions where the fog set in pretty heavy and about a hundred yards visibility max kind of thing and now it's transitioned to, to snow. So we're gonna go and check out a, a knob here close by the camp and see what we can't uh, find but it's pretty tough conditions this morning. So while we wait for the weather to clear, here's the breakdown on the five subspecies of caribou found across North America as defined by the Boone and Crockett Club. Four of these populations are in steep decline. One of them is currently closed to all hunting. And this is information that every hunter who's ever dreamed of hunting caribou needs to know. Starting in Newfoundland, an island that is the far eastern province of Canada, we find the woodland caribou. This is the smallest subspecies of caribou recognized by the Boone and Crockett Club. Once numbering well over 100,000 animals on this island, the population of caribou has been in decline for a few decades and is now numbering somewhere between 20 and 30,000 animals. While some populations on the island are continuing to decline, others have stabilized. And once upon a time, hunters could easily buy a caribou tag and hunt for these highly desired animals. But now, because of this steep population decline, Tag numbers have been drastically cut and they're on a very limited quota and that makes them in high demand. So if you've ever wanted to go hunt for woodland caribou, now is the time before there's a possible closure and book it well in advance so that there's a tag available for you. As we move west into Quebec and then north into the Nunavik region, we find the Quebec Labrador subspecies of caribou. These majestic animals once numbered over an estimated 1.4 million animals in 1990. 
but now, are numbering close to fewer than 150,000 animals by last estimates. Their decline has resulted in the long-term closure of all sport hunting for this subspecies of caribou. The cause of this decline, while argued by many to be the result of over-subsistence harvest, predators, and other causes, was truly the result of overpopulation and overgrazing and destruction of habitat. This is likely not the first time that this has happened in the Arctic. And hopefully someday, 20 or 30 years from now, we will see their populations rebound. And someday, we hope that a future generation of hunters will get to enjoy the hunting of the Quebec Labrador subspecies of caribou on the tundra of Nunavik. But only time will tell. Moving one province to the west, we enter the Nunavut Territory and then the Northwest Territories. This is home to the Central Canadian Barren Ground subspecies of caribou that once numbered over a million animals and roamed a large part of the Arctic and migrated as far south as the northern reaches of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. While Northwest Territories closed its Barren Ground caribou hunting in 2009, None of it has remained a solid destination for hunters seeking to hunt for Central Canadian Barren Ground Caribou. That is until 2016, when tag reductions were implemented in parts of Western None of it, and then again in 2018, when Eastern None of it camps were hit with tag reductions. While the caribou population has continued to decline and overpopulation has had some impact, None of it also has a commercial caribou meat harvest each year by the Aboriginal communities. While this brings economic benefit to those people, it is questioned whether a few hundred sport hunted caribou each year compares to the number of caribou killed for their commercial meat value. No matter how you look at it, sport hunting of caribou and none of it is likely in its last seasons if populations continue to decline. And it will not be long before a second population of caribou is close to sport hunting for the foreseeable future. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures has been sponsored by Bergara Rifles, a passion for precision, every barrel, every rifle. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures has been sponsored by Burris Optics. Find what matters. In Southern Northwest Territories, the Yukon Territory and British Columbia, there is a fourth species of caribou, hardy and strong, big bodied, and sporting massive antlers. The mountain caribou are doing much better than their barren ground cousins. The caribou reside in the and are often seen on sheep hunts, high on the mountainsides. Many populations of mountain caribou don't migrate the hundreds of miles to wintering grounds like the barren ground subspecies, and they thrive in the rough mountains they call home. And finally, the barren ground caribou of Alaska and parts of Northern Yukon Territory. These caribou have seen a lot of change over the years. Most notably, the Mulchatna herd in Western Alaska nearly disappeared and hunting for one of the most notable populations of caribou in the history of Alaska was closed. Today, the Mulchatna herd stands at around 35,000 animals, but herd growth has slowed by strong wolf numbers. Hopefully, hunters are able to reduce predator numbers to an acceptable level and that caribou population rebounds again. While the Mulchatna herd starts to recover, other populations to the north have seen some declines. Some areas are closing, others simply reducing bag limits or placing harvest restrictions on the number of caribou killed. And we're watching closely as some populations on the Alaskan Peninsula have rebounded and some seasons have reopened. And we're taking advantage of some of those season openings to create some new caribou offerings. I hope that while you're watching this, you come to realize that while there are still some huntable populations of caribou all across North America, their populations are in flux. Seasons are not guaranteed moving forward, and you should not expect to see the migrating masses that once looked like ants from the air as they move south to their winter range. If you want to hunt for caribou, you need to make it a priority because tomorrow is not promised. And the caribou situation is, in some cases, dire. And now, after sitting in a tent for several hours, 
the weather has lifted and Travis, Bruce, and their guide Ed are leaving camp and getting their hunt started. All right, we got a, we had a window of opportunity to do some glassing. The weather lifted a bit and we went up on a ridge just above camp and about two hours into glassing, we saw a couple caribou bulls on off in the distance about a, a mile or so away. And wow, what an experience. It's indescribable how cool it is to see a, a caribou for the first time in the Arctic. It's just unbelievable. And hopefully we can find them tomorrow morning and, and put a stock on them. Very cool experience. When we host a client in camp, we will not hunt until they have filled their tag. And that is no different this week. And Travis is all in on helping Bruce fill his caribou tag. We just throw up the phone scope and we've got a pretty decent bull in the middle of it, about a thousand yards away. So um, sounds like Bruce might put a stock on, see if we can't get him. But he's a decent bull for sure. spotting us and kind of started heading the other direction so we're kind of up at the height of land where they were and now we can see them again so we're going to continue on. Just couldn't get close enough and they just kept kind of skirting us and uh, just out of reach the whole day and we tried to wait them out as best we could but uh, today the caribou won so we headed back to camp and we're going to have some lunch and see what happens this afternoon. We decided to go on down to camp and just relax, take it easy. Next thing I know, the guide is saying, caribou, caribou. It's like, what? I'm, I thought I was dreaming. Oh, right behind camp. So we got dressed quick, grabbed our stuff, and buddy, we went up the hill, and there they were, bedded down on the side of the hill. I couldn't believe it. They were right there. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures has been sponsored by Marathon Seat Covers. We've got you covered. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures has been sponsored by Pendleton Ammunition. Loading bullets, one round at a time. I was just overjoyed with being able to experience with Bruce a bucket list hunt for him and be able to be a part of him harvesting a caribou, just something he's dreamed about doing for years. And just being able to be a part of that was one of the highlights of the hunt, if not the highlight for me. Yeah, when I, when I got up to him, then I knew I had, I had accomplished it. I couldn't wait to tell everybody back home because I, they all, I had a lot of people rooting for me, hoping I got something and it felt good to be able to say, I got it done. I got this marked off. And uh, it's a good feeling to have done it. With Bruce's caribou down, the crew carefully breaks down and field butchers the animal, careful to remove all of the meat from the field so that it could make the long journey home and into Bruce's freezer. And after all of the meat is cared for, the trophy is removed from the field and hauled back to camp. So when I first met Bruce in the airport, he told me that this caribou hunt was a bucket list hunt for him, and today he filled that dream and can check that box off. I really enjoyed myself today. Yeah, uh, I, I feel really lucky that we stuck it out and we, uh, we made it happen today. In the Arctic, weather dictates everything. You never know when winter will arrive or if it will ever leave. Today was another long day battling Mother Nature again. Waves and waves of rain, snow, and wind all day, and just trying to find as many breaks in the weather as we could to glass, and, and we spent hours and hours up on the ridge trying to find a lead for caribou, and hopefully we can get on, on them tomorrow. Uh, the outfitter came in uh, this evening as well to uh, 
pick up Bruce and so we said bye to him and um, he's a happy camper going back to base camp and tagged out so we're all excited for Bruce. The next morning Travis and Ed awoke to better weather conditions. In the Arctic, bad weather can stay for days or it can change in minutes. And these are ideal hunting conditions this far north in the Arctic in late August. In August, you could see some larger bunches of cows and calves, but when you're looking for bulls, you're generally gonna see them in pairs or small groups, and they're scattered across the landscape. You're not gonna see a lot of caribou. And the best way to hunt them is to get up on high vantage points and glass. Use your binoculars and spotting scope, locate a good bull, and try to make a stock on them. We saw a couple of caribou fairly far off in the distance that we wanted to put a stock on. One was a, a decent bull. I wouldn't say he's huge, but he was decent. He was, he was a shooter, about a mile and a half or so out. And um, it was tough going, but we decided to go on a stock and, and uh, went after that bull, but it just didn't pan out. We kept getting closer and closer and he just kept getting further and further. And we tried to go around him, but ultimately winded us. And, um, it was a missed opportunity, but you know, it happens, it's hunting and it was kind of a long walk back to camp, not being successful, but uh, nonetheless, I, I, I still enjoyed the stock and it was great to wet, have a break in the weather and be able to see some animals and, and, and get after it and, and actually stock something. So that was cool. This segment of Steve's Outdoor Adventures is sponsored by muzzleloaders.com, carrying the full line of CVA muzzleloaders. This segment is sponsored by Adventure Armory. Rifle, scope, and ammunition packages shipped, ready to shoot. So yeah, it came back to the last day, and when we woke up earlier in the morning, it was, it was really foggy, and so as time was ticking, and we couldn't glass or couldn't, you know, try and find an animal, because we didn't have a lead at that point, um, I was starting to get pretty nervous. All right, so the fog lifted a bit and we were able to spot a couple groups of caribou pretty far off. One about four miles um, and another couple bulls that are probably three miles, but it's a hard three miles in the tundra. Um, but we're gonna go after them and, and see what happens. So we've got a long stalk ahead of us and let's put our heads down and see what we can do. Sometimes in open country like the tundra, to use the terrain, you often have to circle a few miles around the caribou to get an approach that hides you from view. It's a long walk, but if you plan it right, like Travis and Ed just did, it works out. You know, initially first saw the smaller bull, there was two bulls together, saw the smaller one, was actually thinking that we might take that bull because we didn't see the the one that was out of velvet um, right away and we we're kind of getting ready to set up on the on the smaller bull when we noticed that the uh, you know the bigger bull stepped out and so that was a pleasant surprise and we got set up on the bigger bull and ended up taking the shot The shot was only 278 yards, but Travis had to use the tripod in order to shoot over the top of the brush that was concealing their location. And the 300 Winchester Magnum is deadly at that distance, but the Burris Eliminator 3 laser scope made the shot easy because it gave Travis an instant range and aiming point and allowed him to make the perfect shot placement when it mattered most. Double shovel, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that guy. I couldn't be any happier right now with this bull. After a long week of fighting weather and just tough walking on the tundra, and we spotted this, this caribou from about three miles away above camp. And after the, the fog kind of cleared, we decided to, to put on a stock. And about three hours later or so, we put it all together and couldn't be happier with the caliber of bull this is and, and with hours left in the hunt. So. Just extremely excited right now with this bull. 
animals. Travis and Ed carefully butchered the animal, removing all of the meat from the field and filling their packs. They strapped the head and cape on Travis's pack and started hiking. Two guys, one caribou in one trip with heavy packs. The guys were about five miles from camp and it might as well have been 15. And it was nearly dark when they made it back to camp. Yeah, I really enjoyed the week. You know, it was just obviously a, a dream hunt for not only Bruce, but for myself. And, and more importantly, to become educated on what goes on up here and not only the land, but you know, the outfit and the guides and the animal behavior and everything that goes on up here. So that when I get back to the office, I can share that with, with our clients and be able to put them in a position to have an amazing adventure like Bruce and I did. Good weather on the travel day helped everything go smoothly, and Travis returned to the office with stories to share with his clients and more experience under his belt. If you've ever dreamed of going on an Alaskan caribou hunt or any other big game hunting or fishing adventure, give our office a call. We will always take the time to answer your questions and help you book the hunting or fishing adventure of a lifetime. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this week's show, but please remember to join us again next week for another exciting episode of Steve's Outdoor Adventures.